So I'm going to talk about uh, numerical methods for solving multi-phase flows and especially doing uh, wave structure interaction problems. Uh, <clears throat> my journey in fluid structure interaction began almost a decade ago when I was interested in modeling aquatic locomotion of fish fishes. Uh, the video on the left shows a, a, a fish swimming, uh, which is a black horse knife fish in a physical tank in uh, George Lauder's lab in Harvard. And we were trying to model these kinds of fish swimming uh, simulations uh, using immersed boundary methods. We, were want, we wanted to know the flow structures because of the fin, fin motion, because it allows the fish to swim either forward or backward. So I put in a lot of uh, software infrastructure and numerical methods to do these kinds of flow. But they were limited to single phases. Uh, and it's a reasonable assumption for aquatic locomotion because most of the fishes, uh, they have same density as fluid. Okay, so now things are complicated, as is life. And, uh, and mostly in engineering, you would want to model some structures that are either more dense or less dense than the surrounding fluid. A typical example is uh, modeling renewable energy devices, which I'm very much interested in. Uh, examples include wind turbines or wave energy converter devices. And as you can see, in this kind of an application, you would want to model uh, all three phases, air, water, and solid, all together in the domain. So this uh, warrants a multi-phase flow uh, simulation environment. So for example, in, in wind turbines, uh, you have you have to account for the motion of uh, inertia of the blades. Uh, so this is an example of two-phase flow in which you have a highly, highly dense uh, solid region moving in a low-dense uh, uh, air environment. This work is in collaboration with Vishal Bhagman and Indriya Bordo. And we are trying to see the effect of blade geometry on the power extraction uh, here with these kinds of simulations. Another example uh, uh, which, which I am doing uh, these days is modeling wave energy converter devices and uh, this work is in collaboration with uh, Juliana Matiazzo at Polytechnic Court in Torino, the name is over here, branded over here, and uh, they make these devices for Mediterranean Sea. So the way this device works is uh, it has a hull, uh, which is a floating hull, and it has a spinning gyroscope and an electric generator housed inside the floating hull. So the incoming waves, uh, they rock the uh, hull, which produces a pitching torque. And together with uh, the gyroscopic motor, it produces a precession torque, which is fed into the uh, generator, and that converts electricity. And there are cables that run along this uh, hull and feeds into the electric so this is the basic principle. And what we are interested in this modeling is that we want to create an optimal control for these devices so that they can always uh, oscillate in resonance to the incoming waves. And that's the condition which would produce the maximum amount of energy uh, at all conditions. So I promise this is the most engineering part that I have put in here. I will, I will talk about that. <laughs> Uh, high density ratio multi-phase flows are also common in industrial and natural applications. For example, atomization of uh, fuel through nozzle or splash of uh, liquid or pool of liquid or bubbly flows in industrial boiling setting. But the numerical simulation of these flows is very complicated, especially if you consider high density ratios and uh, flows uh, that involve high Reynolds number or high Weber number, which means high surface tension effects. So when that is the case, even very simple case of a water droplet uh, dropping into a pool of liquid, it just uh, gives you hard time. The droplet will crumble and simulations become unstable. So what do we need to do these kinds of uh, simulations? We need a robust multi-phase flow solver that can handle high density ratios. We need an interfacing tracking mechanism to track various phases. And we need an efficient uh, coupling method between uh, liquid phases and, uh, and, and the solid body. And the technique that we uh, will use is called the inverse boundary method to couple solid domain to a robust multi-phase flow solver. So I will first talk about multi-phase flow solver, then our interface capturing methods, and then uh, lastly I will move to uh, inverse boundary methods. So this is a crash course on three topics. 
Okay, so topic number one, multi-phase fluid solver. So our objective uh, for multi-phase flow solver is to develop a, a robust scheme that can solve incompressible Navier-Stokes system uh, with highly varying densities and viscosity ratios of the medium. The approach we take is called uh, single fluid formulation in which we solve the governing equations uh, in, in the entire domain. And different phases are accounted by, uh, by just taking spatially varying densities and viscosity all in the domain. So we saw this method on regular partition grids, although we can put some uh, highly defined regions uh, of grid uh, in the areas of interest. Uh, our discretization approach is that we take, uh, we, we treat the linear terms uh, like gradient of pressure or inertia and viscosity implicitly, and the nonlinear terms, which are the convective terms, we treat that explicitly. And then there is a divergence uh, constraint on the velocity field everywhere. So, uh, getting to the nuts and bolts, uh, we use a staggered uh, discretization scheme in which velocities are on the uh, faces of the uh, cells, and pressure and uh, and the and, and the, and the uh, scalar that tracks the phases they are defined on the cell centers. Your divergence operator is a standard Cartesian uh, operator as same as your gradient operator. And your viscous operator, because of the varying viscosity, uh, you have to do a lot of bookkeeping. Uh, These are some of the things that you need to grab. But once that, uh, all of that algebra is done by a graduate student, <laughs> you can that uh, into a matrix system. And you would want to solve for uh, velocity and pressure variance. Okay. So this is a linear system, and the nonlinear terms have been moved to the right hand side. So there are two main things that I would like to point out uh, to stably resolve a high, highly, uh, a high density ratio of flows. One is how do we invert this matrix efficiently? And second is how do you account for a convective term, uh, making sure that uh, your simulations remain stable? So I will give you the answer first and then details later. So the first, uh, the first question that I pose, how do we invert the system? We have designed a very robust uh, and efficient uh, preconditioner to solve this uh, system in a matrix free sense. And to make sure that uh, our simulations remain stable, uh, we ensure that the mass and momentum transport is consistent. This is, this is the key requirement. So the details are uh, mentioned in the paper that we recently submitted uh, to JCP. Uh, and I'll to go over this. Okay, so for, let's talk about the first part. How do we invert the system efficiently? So, briefly describing, uh, our system consists of uh, three major blocks. One is operator A, that accounts for inertial term and uh, viscous, uh, viscous term, which is a viscous uh, uh, Laplacian, vector Laplacian. G is the gradient term that acts on pressure, and D is the divergence term that acts on velocity. And your right hand side, uh, you have two, uh, right hand side is defined by BU, which is uh, momentum uh, right hand side, and BP is the right hand side the, the, the pressure in, in the divergence free constraint. So as a solver, you would, you would put BP as zero, but as a preconditioner, you will have BP as non-zero because your preconditioner is going to solve for an error residue system. Okay. So we, we want to solve this system simultaneously and not choosing any, any splitting between pressure and velocity. And why would we want to do that? The reason is that uh, because the, the advantages are that we can straightforwardly apply physical boundary conditions, for example, uh, traction or stress boundary condition without incurring any penalty. It does not introduce any time splitting errors as you see in pro uh, classical projection methods. And most importantly, if we, if, we, if we just want to simulate Stokes flow, which does not have any inertia term, you can still do that using the same uh, infrastructure. And, uh, and, and, and we have found that our, our method of solving this equation simultaneously is no less efficient than a projection method or a time splitting approach. Okay, so what is a projection method? Uh, so in the projection method, what you do is uh, you first solve the momentum equation without accounting for the pressure term. So you do you invert a system and find the approximation to a velocity field. This velocity field will, in general, not satisfy the divergence constraint. 
And to do that, you introduce an auxiliary variable or which is similar to pressure, which I represent here as theta. To invert a, a, a variable coefficient for some uh, system to solve for theta. And once you have theta, you correct your original estimate of velocity to get the uh, velocity that satisfies the divergence free constraint. And you also get an approximation to pressure uh, by using this variable theta. So now our approach is you can wrap everything uh, in a projection method as a preconditioner. So in a preconditioner, uh, we do all these operations, uh, but we saw we do not solve the system exactly. So we saw that in a very in a very loose sense, and we give uh, the solution from the system back to the original solver so that it can correct it. Okay, so uh, right, uh, writing uh, for seeing it on a high level, uh, what we do, what we are doing is in the outer solver. We are just uh, using, uh, we are solving the system with a flexible GMR solver with a very tight tolerance. And one thing to notice is that your outer parallel of solver is just doing matrix vector products. It is not inverting and inverse. So it's, it's very uh, efficient and you can just implement this in a matrix free sense. And your projection, uh, solve projection preconditioner requires you to solve uh, a momentum equation and a pressure equation. And you do not need to solve these equations exactly because you are in a preconditional mode. So what we do is we, we use a multi-grid solver with a very loose tolerance of 10 power minus 2 or just 6 iterations or 6 cycles of uh, 6 V cycles. So let's see if this scheme works and it produces a scalable solver. So here is an example to, uh, uh, to test our, uh, our solver. <sighs> we, So we, uh, we have a water uh, phase that is suspended in uh, air phase and the density ratio is about 1000 and the viscosity ratio is about 100. It's a matter of my solution. And if we, if, if we, if we uh, on the y-axis, if we plot the uh, Stokes residue versus the number of iterations as a function of grid size, this is a 2D case, so this is uh, n square grid. So as we see, if we increase the grid size, and to go from a relative tolerance of uh, 10, uh, 1 to 10 power minus 70 to machine precision, we only need 5 iterations. So this is, this is very fast and we are getting, uh, uh, we are solving two, two variables as efficiently as a projection solver. Okay, so that was, that was, uh, that makes sure that our uh, solver is scalable, uh, that with increasing grid size or increasing degrees of freedom, we uh, limit the number of iterations. It doesn't go off. But what about the order of accuracy? So here is a test to see that. We have a, a two-phase flow uh, in which we have a dense uh, bubble uh, is, is, whose density is controlled by, by a factor called RT, RO, and whose viscosity uh, ratio is controlled by a factor RV. And we have a manufactured solution to test this, uh, 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 this problem. And we have different boundary conditions. We have periodic boundary condition in the x direction, and we have uh, tangential stress on the on the uh, on the y directions. So so we, we do two experiments. One is that we keep the viscosity ratio to be ten, but vary the density ratio of the bubble from ten to a million. And you see that uh, in all of these cases, we get uh, second order accuracy in L infinity norm, both in velocity and pressure. In the second set of experiment, uh, we keep the density ratio as 10, but we have the viscosity ratio from 10 to a million. But still, we uh, get second order accuracy in uh, velocity and pressure. And, and a little bit okay, so we have, we have answered this question how do we invert the system and retain the full second order accuracy? And now, the more important question is how do we make sure that uh, our simulations remain stable? for a uh, high density ratio of tools. And the, and the short answer is that we need to make sure that uh, we, we consistently transport mass and momentum in the domain so that these things not happen. Okay, so first I will talk about interface tracking mechanism for our, our simulation. We use level set field to track interfaces between different phases. So briefly, level set is a sign distance function that satisfies the ideal equation 
uh, the value of level set is negative in phase 1, uh, positive in phase 2, and wherever level set is 0, that gives us the implicit definition of it. Uh, so how do we, how do we, uh, when, when, if our simulations are progressing in time, how do we move the interfaces? So what we do is we move the level set phi uh, by the fluid velocity, which is just an advection equation. And once you do that, you lose the sign distance property. So, uh, so to make sure that your level set satisfies the sign distance property, you solve a uh, reinitialization equation by using a pseudo time stepping scheme. And this, this, this makes sure that your advected level set retains the sign distance property at steady state. It, it may so also happen that once you are advecting the level set and reinitializing it, you may be losing some masses in phases. And to uh, make sure that you do not lose mass, you can put a penalization that your original volume should be conserved. So this, these are some of the tricks that you can apply to um, mass conservation for level set. Okay, so what can we do if we know if we know the level set speed? For example, if if we if we if we affect the level set phi from phi n time step n to time new time step n plus one, we can then set densities and viscosities in, in all in all of our domain. Okay, this is a good idea for setting uh, viscosity, but uh, this is a bad idea for density, and I will I will show you why. So what has been done uh, in literature uh, is the following. So this is the time stepping scheme uh, that has been used over and over again in the literature. So you do from moving from time step n to time step n over one, you first advect the level set from n to n plus one, then use this new level set information to set your density and viscosity all over the domain. And then you solve incompressible non stokes equation to update your velocity and pressure. And then you move on to the next step. So if, here you see, if you do that, then you are decoupling the transport of mass, which is basically the advection of level set. Level set is, gives you your mass transport. And the momentum transport, which is your convective operator in INS equations. So there is no connection between these two uh, parts. And this is the cause of instabilities. So what is a consistent time stepping scheme? So here is one. So first, what you do is you, you synchronize your density field using the level set information at time step level n. Then you solve your mass balance equation throughout the domain, which is a convective equation, advection equation, to update your density field rho n plus 1. And you will notice that to solve this equation, you have to define mass fluxes uh, to update rho. And what you do is you store this information. Okay. Next, in third step, you move your level set from n to n plus 1 and set your viscosity field using the updated level set information. And you solve your uh, Navier-Stokes equation in conservative form. And if you solve your uh, equations in conservative form, then your convective operator would be of this form. And this will, this will uh, require you to have mass fluxes in your convective operator. And the idea is to use the same mass flux in convective operator as you did in your advection of density. So if you make sure that your mass fluxes are connected uh, in, the, in the density field as well as in your momentum equation, then it's a consistent transport and this stabilizes your simulations. Okay, so uh, here, here's a breakdown. So in the inconsistent or in the non-conservative form, your mass, uh, uh, mass flux in the convective operator is decoupled from your uh, density field. But in the consistent transport, you are coupling your mass fluxes in the density update and your uh, uh, fluid moment convective operator. Okay, so this, this was one part. Another thing is that your densities have a bound. For example, in your domain, your density cannot go below air phase density and it cannot go above water phase density. So not only you you need to uh, couple the momentum and uh, mass transport, you also need to make sure that your uh, very, uh, your convection is bounded so that they do not undershoot or overshoot the limits. So in literature, people generally use TVD schemes for, uh, for, uh, for doing uh, filming or for doing convection. But there are certain limiters that also make sure that you do not exceed the bounds. 
and one such limiter is CUI, uh, which is which stands for cubic open interpolation. And this is a very simple uh, very simple limiter, and it makes sure that your density field does not undershoot or overshoot. And this is a, a key requirement. Okay, here are some examples. Uh, so it, uh, the situation is like this: you have an inviscid flow. You have a dense bubble whose density is about a uh, uh, million, maybe a collapsed neutron star, and you are just pushing it if you are God. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if you let it uh, move with an initial velocity 1, you expect it to return back to its original position after t is equal to 1. So this is the all in periodic way. The inconsistent scheme produces these spurious interfaces and it just breaks down your uh, simulation. But in the consistent transport, uh, you see that it basically goes out and comes back and it comes at time t is equal to 1. Okay, so uh, we did this uh, simulation in 3D also and on adaptive meshes. So the top row shows you uh, inconsistent transport and consistent scheme breaking down. But your bottom row is a consistent scheme and it remains stable for the simulation time. So that was a basically uh, academic problem. Uh, what about real problems? So real problems like uh, air water interfaces. So the same thing, it's a very common uh, problem to see a collapse of water column. Uh, and this is air phase, this is water phase. The inconsistent scheme uh, just does a horrible job. But the consistent scheme, it produces the right spreading uh, as a function of distance. And this is, it's 3D dozen and you see that uh, capture all these complex phenomena and make them any our simulations are stable. There's a comparison with uh, some of the experimental data and simulations and we get pretty pretty good match uh, with the spreading of this interface as a function of time. So one, uh, one interesting thing is that even your inconsistent transport, they can produce uh, consistent physical results even at higher uh, density regions. But the condition is that your Reynolds number and your Weber number has to be small. So this is a, a droplet impinging on a pool of liquid at Reynolds number 6.6 .6 and 66. And we get pretty physical deformations and spreading of the liquid and uh, the schemes remain stable. But for a uh, high Reynolds number and high weapon number, uh, you see all these are physical results. Here, but, but the consistent scheme makes sure that uh, your, you get right physical uh, solutions in the domain. Uh, here we compare the lamella uh, radius uh, as a function of time with the experimental uh, with the simulation results in the literature. And we are making heavy use of adaptive meshes uh, to track these interfaces. Okay, so next, uh, crash course number two, fluid structure interaction. Okay, so the objective here is to uh, solve uh, <coughs> a couple of fluid structure domains so that we can get a numerical solution that produces velocity and pressure field in the entire domain, which is occupied by fluid, and a domain uh, which gives you rigid body velocity occupied by the uh, solid body. So, uh, so there are two ways to do this kind of fluid structure interaction. One is using uh, body fitted meshes, uh, which is a simulation shown over here. The advantage is, is that you can uh, pretty much get very accurate interfaces uh, and sharp results uh, in your velocity and pressure fields as a function of time. But the most biggest disadvantage is that you have to remesh at every time step and it increases your computation cost a lot. The other approach is called the fictitious domain method or the inverse quantum method in which you extend the fluid equations into your solid domain and you solve everything assuming that it is a liquid and introduce some additional body forces in the solid domain to, account, to make sure that it's not a liquid but that a solid. The disadvantage is that it, it can lead to uh, first of all, first order accuracy near the uh, structured interfaces. Uh, but you can throw in a lot of uh, mesh to get over that uh, in any case. So basic terminologies uh, that are used in immersed quantum methods are following. Uh, imagine you have a fluid domain that is called on the background grid. It is called the Euler grid. 
and you have a structure or the uh, moving uh, solid that is represented by marker points. This is called the Lagrangian mesh. So each of these mesh, they may or may not be connected to each other. And but what is common is that each of these nodes, they have certain forcing uh, on, on, on that. And what you need to do is, you need to have this, uh, whatever is the force, you need to put that force into the uh, uh, momentum equation to make sure that your fluid solver knows that you are present over there. And this operation is called force spreading operation. You take the force from the Lagrangian mesh and put it into the into vicinity of the fluid. The adjoint operator is called the velocity interpolation operator. You have uh, fluid velocity on the background grid and you would want to interpolate that velocity onto this marker point so that you can move uh, your structure. Okay. So this kind of method was uh, created by Charlie Peshkin in the 1970s uh, to do uh, hard, hard wall simulations. And the assumption was that uh, your domain or your Lagrangian markers are connected by springs or beams and their stretching uh, is, is governed by some constitutive law of, of material. But if you, if you try to do these kinds of simulations uh, for a rigid for a rigid kind of uh, structure, then you have to, have to increase the stiffness of the springs. And this penalizes your system and it causes you have to take very small time steps uh, to overcome the uh, elastic time scale. But what do we do with rigid bodies? So a clever formulation was uh, created by Glowinski and Patankar and that is called uh, distributed Lagrange multiplier. So what does that say is that if, imagine you have a fluid domain and a solid domain and, the, and you have to impose a constraint in the solid domain. But the rate of deformation tensor is zero in the region occupied by the solid. So, and, and this, this condition would be satisfied if your velocity in the solid domain is a rigid body uh, velocity. So it is trivial to show that if you substitute velocity, a rigid body velocity over here, rate of deformation tensor is zero. So that's the uh, rigidity constraint you need to satisfy. Okay, so as, as an as a algorithm, how do we implement this uh, rigidity constraint? in an efficient manner. So we start with the uh, conservation of uh, fluid momentum and we extend it to the solid domain. So you have your conservation of mass that is satisfied not only by the fluid but also by the solid. So here pressure acts as a Lagrange multiplier that makes sure that your divergence of velocity is equal. Then what about the uh, region of space that is occupied by the solid? So you add an additional body force Fc that makes sure that uh, your solid is indeed moving with the rigid body velocity. So that's, that's the uh, Lagrange multiplier. And you use the machinery of inverse warning method to put your Lagrangian constraint forces uh, from Lagrangian mesh back to the Eulerian grid. And you interpolate your uh, Eulerian velocity onto the Lagrangian marker points. So that's the machinery. So how do we implement this uh, efficiently in, uh, in, in, in our solvers? So what we need to do in the context of multi-phase flows, we not only need to track uh, air, air gas interfaces, but also uh, solid interface because we would want to put a density of the solid on the domain. The viscosity of the solid does not matter. Uh, it could be anything. But what we generally take is the, uh, dense, uh, the most viscous fluid and substitute that viscosity in the solid region. So if, if you are dealing with simple geometries like cylinders or spheres, uh, tracking, creating a level set is trivial. It's just an equation for circle or sphere. You can find the distance function analytically. But what do you do with, if you are an engineer like me and want to do car simulations? So what we do is we import the mesh geometry and we physically go ahead and calculate uh, the distance function from this interface uh, uh, using computational geometry. And this is this is a finite element mesh that we import, and this is the zero contour that we get from the distance function. To represent complicated points. Okay, so imagine we have uh, 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 there's a discretization of a uh, constraint IP method. We have uh, air water interface. Air water interface, and we have our 
solid interface. And inside the solid, we put some Lagrangian modulus because we want to use Emus module machinery to apply that constraint. So our first step is to first solve uh, incompressible Navier Stokes everywhere in the domain. And by the way, this algorithm is going to work only for uh, non-zero Reynolds number. It's not applicable for zero Reynolds number. I can talk about that later. So if, if you are at zero uh, non-zero Reynolds number, which is the case I am interested in, I will first solve uh, fluid velocity and pressure everywhere in the domain, even including the solid region. So this velocity field would be uh, correct in most part of the domain, but incorrect near the solid interface and inside the solid interface. As a next step, as a, uh, what I will do is I will project the velocity in the, uh, the uncorrected velocity in the solid domain onto a field that is, uh, that is the correct solid body velocity. So for that, it, uh, remember in our projection method we have differential of theta. In the same case, we have a differential of velocity. This is the body. This is the uh, velocity that I want in my solid domain, and this is the velocity uh, that was given by the fluid solid. So I take a dif differential of that. And what what is this uh, desired velocity in the solid domain? It should be a rigid body velocity. There are two cases that we can do. One is we know this uh, rigid body velocity a prime. For example, we a cylinder with a prescribed um, translation velocity. We know this already. So we will just substitute, substitute over there and project the uncorrected velocity to a correct velocity. But what do we do if you want to do the real fluid structure interaction? We need to calculate translation velocity and the rotation velocity of the solid. So how do we do that? So basically what we do is we say that all of this momentum in the domain is correct. It's just distributed in the wrong fashion. We need to correct that. So if, if all the fluid in this domain was acting as a rigid body, then I can, if I integrate that momentum, uh, like the linear momentum, that should just be equal to the mass of the body times the rigid body velocity. So using that constraint, I can find the rigid body velocity. Similarly, if I find the angular momentum in that uncorrected domain, I, that should be equal to the inertia tensor times the rotation velocity. So I can solve these two uh, balance equations to find qr and omega, and I get my desired velocity, and I put it over here, and basically that's that's the algorithm. So I correct my velocity at the at the end of the time step and in the solid. So it's a, it's a time splitting approach that works well for high Reynolds number or moderate Reynolds number. But this is not, not the algorithm you should be using for zero Reynolds number because you would want to impose the velocity in the solid at the same time you are solving uh, uh, fluid equations because there is no time derivative term in the Stokes equation. And let's not go look on that. So now moving on to wave structure interaction problems, the title of my talk. Fine. So here I'm doing a simple test case in a sense. Uh, I'm generating waves by imposing some velocity boundary condition over here. And these was velocity boundary conditions are obtained from wave theory as in potential flow. So there are various wave theories in the literature like the second order strokes or sinusoidal waves or a um, lot of different wave theories. Basically those gives you uh, those theories give you velocity in the domain and the surface elevation as the wave is propagating. So in our algorithm we, we use these uh, wave theories to generate velocities in the water phase. And this uh, by this, with an assumption that these velocities will generate waves that will propagate uh, from left to right. So we want to have some damping zone at the end of our domain because we do not want reflection of waves coming back into system and building our uh, solution. To do a wave structure interaction, uh, we have a submerged trapezoid and this is a prescribed uh, fluid structure interaction case where the velocity of the body is set to zero. In this experiment, we have certain uh, wave gauges along the length of the domain to measure the wave elevation and uh, <coughs> 
accepted that experimentally as well as in the literature. So there are two cases. Uh, one is uh, wave propagation without an immersed body. Uh, wave propagation with a submerged uh, trapezoid or a body. So there are some pictures. We generate waves and then they propagate uh, from left to right. And uh, we get nice sinusoidal waves. But when you have a submerged body, the depth of the uh, water body decreases and this causes uh, waves to bunch up. And this is the same effect you see water waves coming to the uh, to, to your shore and they just collapse or they uh, become steam and they break. It's the same effect. So without the, uh, uh, without the body immersed, you would expect the surface elevation to match the Stokes theory and you get nice match with the analytical result. And with the submerged body, there have been some experiments, numerical as well as physical, and we get these wave elevations at different stations that I showed you previously, and this is a good So, for practical uh, moving bodies that are floating or impinging your air water interface, here is one example. You release a cylinder uh, that is uh, half buoyant and water, uh, uh, and then make it, make it oscillate and uh, it will dissipate all of its uh, potential energy through the viscosity of the liquid and it will come to an equilibrium position uh, which is half submerged in water. So we do some grid resolution uh, tests and it matches very well with the experiments of I2 that was done by 1977. So these are all these uh, vortices by the way. So here, here is an example that shows uh, what happens if you use inconsistent transport uh, in, in, in case of crystal interaction. So here is a wedge that is uh, falling, uh, its density is half that of water. You see it becomes quickly unstable. And here is a consistent scheme with all these fireworks. And this is a three-dimensional uh, three well, then simulation that in three dimensions. So, and we use a lot of EMR to track uh, regions of solid and regions of high vorticity and near water interfaces. So, these all these extra blocks they are covering uh, vorticities, uh, tracking vorticity regions. And we get nice uh, comparison with experimental and uh, simulation results recorded in the literature. So here is one uh, case done by Marin Lab in Netherlands. It's a collapse of water column in three dimensions over an obstacle. The objective is to measure pressures at different points on the immersed structure. And there are also sensors that measure the height uh, of the, of the, of the uh, water interface as it collapses. Here is a uh, simulation of that collapse of water of an obstacle. And basically, we are, we are measuring pressure on this uh, body and some uh, probes to measure the wave elevation or the height of the water. And we get uh, nice results with uh, both uh, with pressure sensors as well as with uh, uh, height of the water uh, uh, once, it, once it reaches that level. So, these are experimental data from Netherlands and these are uh, results to simulations using volume of fluid. So everything that I presented uh, is, has been done using IPMR. It's an open source code uh, that relies on a lot of libraries. For AMR grids, we use Samurai from Norris Dewar National Lab. All the media algebra uh, stuff is done using Petsy and the body uh, representation using finite elements is uh, done using the mesh. It's just written in C, C++ and program and uh, it's available on GitHub and a lot of folks are using this software um, in, in the US and Canada and other places and we actually support uh, new features as required by uh, other researchers. I welcome you to develop into this if this is useful. Conclusions. So we definitely need a consistent transport of mass and momentum for uh, resolving high-density ratio flows. 
to make them stable. And this is done, uh, and we did this using level sets. Uh, people have argued that only volume of fluid methods could be used to do this consistent transport. We have shown that this could be done using level sets. And uh, projection methods, uh, they, they have been classically used to solve a compressible now useful system, and they were always thought to be more efficient. But um, we show that it, it, they are, you can basically solve the couple system together as, effect, as efficiently as the projection solve. So um, that's my conclusion. That's the end of my talk. I have not. Um, so basically, if you if you want to do uh, mass exchange or phase change, then you have to apply some jump conditions on the on on the air water interface or whatever phases you are modeling. So there are some additional uh, terms in your uh, in your density equation. Uh, so the equation that I showed you affect your mass. You have to put some additional jump conditions on that. People have done that in level set method, but it uh, should be easy to, not relatively easy to understand. <laughs> Nothing easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what? Because of the work that I'm familiar with, we've been walked away from how they interact with structures, the schemes of the fluid is in this. Yes. So, what are the effects you think you get by putting in those? That's a very interesting. I was also expecting that I would get horrible results. Uh, because I have uh, uh, vorticities around the air water interface and um, I'm on the bottom of the ocean or bottom of the surface. But to my surprise, they match pretty well actually. So the reason is that um, even though your vis uh, viscosity of air is small, it, even if you have higher uh, ratios of velocity derivatives, it multiplies with a very small number and then your stresses are small, and that does not affect your wave animation. So that your method is misbehaving if you take that limit sometimes? Take which? Well, I'm thinking about can you take the air the absence? Could you remove the air? I could remove the air, but uh, then I lose the nice property of simulating the uh, everything on a nice Cartesian course. So I want to solve the two phases just because I want to solve everything in rectangular process. But there, if, if I plot the vorticity, I do see some streak of vorticity along the air water interface and near the bottom. And to my surprise, it still matches very well with the invasive results. Any other I don't think you mentioned surface tension. Are you bringing that in as well? Yes. Is it just like a force? It's a body force term in the momentum equation. Yeah. So we just assume the surface tension coefficient is constant. And then apply as a, as a continuum force rather than like a jump in pressure. But we do account for that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> how do you pick how many Lagrangian points to put in? Yes, so the method works best if you put one Lagrangian point per uh, oil AM. So one marker in a cell. So you don't want to overcrowd it. And you have to put the points within the solid as well, or can you just put them near the surface of the solid? Yeah, so if you if you are just doing like a stationary body, you can just put it over the uh, uh, just on the surface. But if you have like motion of the solid, then I put everything in the domain because I want inside also behave like a solid. Otherwise, you will have spurious sloshing that will affect your. Um, motion if you move uh, ahead in time, right? so okay. create extra momentum. But I am also working on a scheme where you have the spreading and interpolation just from one side of the interface. So you can basically ignore your uh, interface on uh, material on the other side of the interface. That requires developing special kernels, interpolation and spreading kernels. So that talk to only one part of the unit. In that case you just put uh, markers only on the surface. 
So we are doing a uh, flow over cars and uh, it's just using surface marker points. And even at Reynolds number of million, we do not see any sloshing or any spurious momentum inside the car. It's only on the outside. So we have a lot of grad students. So can you maybe just comment on when you sort of became really good at numerics? And <laughs> when did that happen? Like, when did you really start getting into it? Like, as an undergrad, as a grad student? So I think it happened during my first year of grad student, uh, grad student life. So my advisor gave me a Fortran code, and I I disliked it so much that I was looking for other values. <laughs> and uh, I stumbled upon this uh, C++ code, which I could actually read and understand. And when I decided I would go with this instead of the code that it was imposed on. <laughs> so I I. I said that I'm going to work on this and I have to prove myself. All right, well, thank you so much. We have this gift board for something. Wow. Yeah, it's a wonderful talk, and let's thank our speaker one more time.